So you guys met a few years ago, college time. Tell us your story. You're going to have to hold that up nice and close. There you go. It was actually more more like a decade ago. Okay. That's a few years. That's a few (laughs) years. Yeah. So, yeah, uh, I'm Jan. This is my wife, Christina. We met quite a while ago in college, and we are going to share our story with you. Now, first of all, if you ever want to clear out a room really quickly, just walk in there and be like, my name is so-and-so, and I'm a sex addict. <laughs> and then just watch people just go for the exits. <laughs> Glad we're not doing that today. All right, great. Good. No, I see a couple stragglers. <laughs> all right. So I was exposed to pornography at a very, very young age. I was about 10, 11 or so, found it by chance, and kept it hidden because my sex talk from my parents was, don't do sex because if you do it outside of marriage, you will go to hell. And you only do it to make more babies. So that, that was pretty much it. Everything else was a hush-hush. And it's like, oh, and if you do it, and if you watch pornography, then you're just going to get a beating. Beatings were very common in my household. So I had to learn how to lie very well to keep it hidden. So fast forward some years, and I'm in college taking the Running Star program. I meet this lovely lady over here. We have a lot of deep conversations and whatnot, and so I decided to take a chance. I'm like, well, this is going to be serious, obviously. You can't fool around here. So what the heck, I'll just let her know that, hey, I have this kind of an issue I've been struggling for with years, just so that everything is out in the open and there's no surprises. So I let her know. And uh, we, we talked about it a lot, and um, I, was, I had no idea what it was. Honestly, I had no idea. Um, because I was raised in like a little, I don't know, tent or something. Um, there were a lot of rocks piled on top of that tent. Um, anyways, so um, I just said, you know, hey, I'll be your accountability partner. You know, you can tell me when you're struggling. Um, it just wasn't a big issue. Um, because we both thought that when we got married, it would go away. So anyways, we did get married um, in 2013. And um, everything was going smoothly. He was my best friend. We just talked about everything. But um, he didn't tell me how he was doing because he was very ashamed that it continued into the marriage. Um, So about a year and a half into the marriage, he came to me and said, hey, I went to the hospital today because I feel really bad about something I've been lying to you about. And he said, you better sit down. (laughs) So I sat down and he told me that he had been struggling with pornography for the whole time that we were married and that he didn't tell me because he was really ashamed. So... I said, you know, I forgive you, and I'll never leave you, and we'll work this out, and um, it just kept progressing, and um, pornography is such a, it's such a huge, heavy thing. People want to dumb it down and just say, oh, it's just a screen, it's just, you know, people, and no big deal, but um, if you're not really, really careful, and even if you are, (laughs) it will really, it just destroys And um, so I saw him go from the man that was the most amazing person down to someone who didn't even want to go outside for a walk because he was just on his computer all the time and he lost his jobs and I was working and I would come home and he was struggling so bad and it was awful. That's a tough spot for you guys to be in. Yeah. Yeah. What what happened next? Well, essentially, when I did confess... What happens was the shame and the guilt builds up inside of you so bad, you can only take so much. I guess I hit my threshold after about a couple of years, and that's what was causing some sort of chest pains, and that's, I thought I was, my heart was going out, something was wrong with it medically. Mm-hmm. But after, after I confessed, we tried filters, we tried accountability things, tried... Um, tried a couple of groups and whatnot, but I beat every single filter, every single software. Like necessity is the mother of invention. And when you're an addict and something has a really big grasp over you, you'll find a way to get to it. It doesn't matter. Um, Eventually, after not having a screen or a computer, I'd start going to stores and gentlemen clubs and whatnot. And Pornography is not a light thing. So 
I deteriorated as a human being. Uh, my soul was deteriorating. And eventually the degradation caused me just to be a shell. Uh, my personality was not there anymore. It was nothing. It's almost, uh, it's like a demonic force has complete control over you and your soul is somewhere trapped away. Yeah. That's how bad it gets. And that's the lowest it gets. You do what you don't want to do and you have no choice and no say about it. So, um, needless to say, I tried everything that I possibly could. I was very religious at that time, and I was attending um, a place that's in the Book of Cults, and I was very judgmental, and um, I didn't know what to do. So I thought, I'll search the Bible and see what to do. And in the Bible, there's one reason that you can leave someone. And I was like, good, I have that reason, perfect. So I divorced him, and um, I was very high and mighty about it. I'm right, you're wrong, you mistreated me, um, I was perfect, I did everything right, and God had a lot to show me about that. So <laughs> I, um, I moved into a cabin on the top of a mountain by myself. Um, I started coming here, um, and I was just with God. It was just me and God, and I was alone, and I wanted to be because I wanted to see my wrong because I knew that marriage isn't, you know, 100% someone else's fault. So God surprised me with so many things that I realized um, I'm a teacher, so I started seeing the vulnerability and the, the, the children in my class and how they were struggling because of their childhood and because of the things, and I started to see, and I started to love them more, and um, that sort of started spilling over into my thoughts toward him, like, wow, I wonder what I did to him by being so religious and judgmental. I wonder if that was helpful or not. Um, I wonder if I could have, not that I could have changed him, I know he that doesn't work. But what did I do that I need to say sorry for? So about three years later, two and a half years later, we had no contact. We were like, no phone numbers, nothing. Um, so I took a class and they encouraged us to find the people who we had wronged and just tell them that we're sorry and move on. So I stalked him on the internet and eventually found his little sister on Instagram. And um, I got his number, and I called him, and I say, hey, there's 42 things that I'd like to apologize for that I've been thinking about over the last, um, you know, two years. She loves numbers. <laughs> I love lists. So I, I read them off to him, and he said, you know, I've already forgiven you. And I was like, what? Okay. Um, what happened to you over the time? And he told me what he had been doing, and I was totally shocked because I thought he was a lost cause and that he he would never find God in this. So he was doing some stuff he'll tell you about. <laughs> so this is a more of a recent discovery, but um, it was pain thresholds. I had a really rough childhood growing up. Uh, like I said, a lot of beatings, a lot of degradation, you know, saying that you're worthless, you'll never amount to anything. Uh, punishment for if you do something bad punishment if you lie, punishment if you say the truth about you doing something bad. There's no way out of it. I became a master liar by the age of seven. I uh, can get away with anything, look somebody straight in the eye, boom, you'll believe me. It'll be great, right? But no, it wasn't great. So anyway, I learned how to completely ignore feelings and all sorts of emotions to be a cold and calculated machine because of my childhood. So I started applying this to my divorce because I'm like, well, something doesn't feel right, so I'm just going to block everything out. Um, the sexual addiction actually spiraled out of control even more from there. From there, it was just going downwards and downwards, heavier and heavier. I got into really good shape and started uh, and advanced that with one-night stands and hunting for shallow, carnal relationships. And... I didn't know what I was doing. I couldn't really feel, couldn't really think. I existed. Uh, one night, I was hitting the bottle a little too hard, and that kind of broke the bottle of holding the emotion on the inside. So I kind of spilled out, uh, you know, just being by myself, nobody around, just finally starting to feel these uh, things I've been repressing for years. And uh, it was pretty hard. I think that was my lowest point in my life. I turned my own weapon on myself, and I was heavily considering uh, ending it. And 
right before I did it, um, God spoke to me and told me, uh, put it down, go to bed, sleep it off. Tomorrow things will start to get better. And so I listened, <laughs> mm. obviously. Mm. I put my weapon down. I went to bed. I slept it off. Tomorrow, boom, came. And you know what? I felt better. I don't know why. I don't know how. But I felt like something happened. And then I got a new job. Uh, I was assembling cabinets. And the very first day on the job, my boss started talking to me about sexual addiction. <laughs> <laughs> In the car, he's like, hey, so are you a sex addict? Wow. Like, very first conversation ever. I'm like, dude, what? <laughs> it, didn't, it didn't clear the room, though. You stayed with it. It didn't clear the truck. It, it was all locked, truck. and they were driving. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, it can't clear the truck, because I'm like, all right, this guy knows something. Like, is he, yeah. like, a psychic or something? Like, yeah. what's going on? <laughs> so anyway, I started conversing with him, you know, asking lots of questions, figuring out what happened, and apparently he had... Uh, something similar along the lines to where his marriage almost broke up because of it and there was unfaithfulness and whatnot and he found a way out. He found a way to freedom. He found a way to where pornography no longer had a grasp on him, where sexuality was not the driving force of his life. I was intrigued. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is, this is my way out. I just need to follow this guy. I need to stick with him. Hmm. Uh, so I was like a like a tail on, on a dog, just following him <laughs> everywhere, spending all my time with him. And he introduced me to a Pure Desire group, where Pure Desire, if you guys don't know about it, it works with sexual addiction. You know, it digs deep into your past, has all these psychological exercises that make you remember your pains, process them properly, and then move on. So I was doing that for quite a while, and I started seeing improvement. It was incredible. At first it was, I can go a day without relapsing, then maybe a few days, weeks. Started getting much, much better. I started getting my personality back. I stopped hunting for relationships. I started enjoying life and realizing what's going on. Um, and then what, how did you guys reconcile when Christina so then, called um, you? So I called him, and he, and he explained that to me, and I was shocked. And then he said, do you want to go out for dinner? Because I could tell you more. And I was like, why not? Okay. Um, but that was a huge step so in, that, in that moment. It was really a difficult decision, honestly. It was like, oh, crap. I never saw this coming. Um, I was all, like, healed. I had done so much counseling. I'd spent thousands of dollars on my health and blah, blah. And I didn't want to get back into this. Um, so, anyways, we went out for dinner, and we had some great conversation. And uh, we decided, hey, let's just date and see how this goes. And um, for, I think, for about three weeks or something, we dated. And then we were like, okay, we're going to reconcile our marriage. And so we bought a book, and we got super serious about it. Um, and then we... Um, I already had a contract to work in Thailand for a year, so I was I went over there hoping that we could continue with long distance. That didn't work, so I asked him to come over. He came over. He got a job at the school. They gave him a job, and then we got married, like, I don't know, three weeks after he got there. So that's our story. <laughs> yeah, we got now, married. Uh, what was now it? Now it's been like a year and a half since we got married, and now we're going to have our first baby. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. I'm three and a half months, even though it doesn't look like it, so... <laughs> But, like, as a side note to guys, because I know a lot of guys struggle with it, you know, I've never ever been caught in my entire life, and you might not get caught, or you may have more willpower than me, and you might think, hey, I could do this on my own. No, I can't. You can only do it with God. Mm -hmm. So yeah. there is help if you guys need it, and there is a way out, and I'm living proof of it. You know, it's progress, not perfection. It gets better over time. That's right. It's, you know, over a decade of self-abuse like that, it's going to take a while to heal. So. Yeah. But there's hope. There yeah, is hope. There's, hope there's a lot of there's hope. There's hope and there's freedom. <laughs> yeah. And that's the important part. Thank you, guys. Appreciate you. Yeah.